Welcome everybody to the last webinar of the neuroergonomics series today. Uh, it's on social neuroergonomics and I'm excited to first introduce you to the field of neuroergonomics and the editorial board and then also present you with a short overview over the five uh, grand challenges that uh, we as an editorial board have identified for the next, um, I mean, at least 10, 15 years for us to work on. And then I'm even more excited uh, that uh, we could convince an amazing uh, set of keynote speakers to share with us their um, pioneering research in that field. So very excited um, uh, about this webinar. So let me first introduce you the board um, of the social neuroergonomics branch within Frontiers in Neuroergonomics. On the one hand, that's uh, Frank Krüger. He is the specialty chief editor. He's currently um, a professor of social neuroscience at George Mason University. His research interests um, include the neural underpinnings of social beliefs, neural correlates of trust in social diets and neural signatures of social norm violations. And then on the other hand, it's me. I'm the assistant specialty chief editor. My name is Eva Wiese. Um, I'm currently professor of cognitive psychology and cognitive ergonomics at the Berlin Institute of Technology. And before that, I've been a professor at George Mason University as well for about eight years. Um, my research interests include causes and effects of mind perception in human-robot interaction, um, social cognition in dynamic human-robot interactions, and cognitive offloading and embodied cognition with a focus on um, offloading cognitive processes to social agents such as social robots. We have an amazing uh, editor uh, editorial board. Um, we have a lot of research editors too that I couldn't list on these slides, but you see here our associate editors. Um, we are always interested in um, having more associate editors. So if anybody feels called, please contact us and join our editorial board uh, together. As editors, we cover a very broad area of expertise within the field of social neuroscience and human factors. And that includes mental states uh, classification, brain computer interfaces in social interactions, social robotics, trust in automation, biometrics, artificial intelligence, human factors in transportation and medical systems, adaptive social technologies, hyperscanning, mobile uh, neuroimaging, human machine teaming, telepresence, rehabilitation, and many, many others. Before I talk about the challenges that we as an editorial board have identified in the field of neuroergonomics, let me briefly define what we mean when we say social neuroergonomics. First, and the people who have attended other webinars of the series have seen this definition before, Neuroergonomics is defined as the study of the brain at work in everyday life. That's a definition by Raja Parasuraman in 2003. So neuroergonomics as a field aims at understanding human brain function, underlying human interaction with technical systems. Social in this context, and this is not a definition that's uh, complete, but it gets us quite, you know, it, it, it defines social machines quite well. Social refers in this, this context to machines that are autonomous, that are physically embodied, that interact with other physical agents by following social norms and behaviors that are associated with their role, display physical and or behavioral signs of human likeness. So that means they look like humans or they have certain features of humans or they and or they behave like human agents do. And, and that's most important here, trigger behavioral and or neural patterns reminiscent of human-human interactions. Social neuroergonomics, neuroergonomics as a field is a transdisciplinary field devoted to the application of knowledge of the neurobiological underpinnings of social processes in behaviors, 
to the design, engineering, and evaluation of human machine systems. So that means that we are really interested in the entire range of neurobiology, neurophysiology, neuroscience, ranging from single cell recordings or even molecular and genetic processes to looking at behavior and, and you know, neuroimaging um, studies um, with human participants. And then design, engineering, and evaluation means that we are interested in studies that deal with developing or the conceptualization of um, social machine systems, the actual implementation of the engineering part of those systems, and then also the neuropsychological or psychological evaluation of these systems. And for neuroergonomics as a field, we really want to have this balance between, or like this combination of understanding the social nature of human brains so like that would be the basic research part and the principles of human centered design. So that would be more the human factors and engineering and computer science part. And by combining these two areas, social neuroergonomics has the potential to advance our understanding of the psycho neurobiological basis of human social interactions with technology and to use these insights to foster more efficient and also satisfying human machine interactions. So after this very brief introduction and broad definition of the field, I'd like to introduce you to the challenges in neuroergonomics and uh, social neuroergonomics. And we need to make a minor adjustment to our neuroergonomics. Um, uh, I can for this, but now we are ready to, to dive right in. So Frank Krüger and I have um, written up these uh, grand challenges in a short article that you can check out if you like uh, in Frontiers in Neuroergonomics. Um, and we have said that the first challenge is really to move studies in this field from observation to interaction. And what do, I, what do we mean by that? I'm sure you all know that in the past, and my research is certainly guilty of that as well, we have used very static, non-dynamic paradigms where people just watch um, certain stimuli that are presented in a very predictive manner on the screen while lying in a scanner or sitting in an EEG cabin doing an experiment. Um, social neuroscience has um, provided evidence for quite some time now that that is okay as an approach, but it doesn't accurately um, depict or summarize all of the really core social processes that are going on in dynamic social interactions between social agents. So what we really need is a so-called so, uh, second person framework where you examine neural mechanisms in real time reci reciprocal social interactions between humans and machines. So here's an example. On the left would be an observation paradigm where people look at a classical paradigm. In this case, it's one of my studies, a gaze queuing study with a um, social robot while lying in a traditional fMRI scanner. On the right side, this is a paradigm that, that my colleague and friend Agnieszka Wikowska um, has used in her uh, lab at IIT in Genoa. Um, it's an adaptation of the gaze queuing paradigm now using EEG with a real social robot in a, a, a relatively realistic environment, um, allowing dynamic interactions between the human and the robot. And social neuroergonomics as a field should really help develop, test and validate such new dynamic paradigms and not only focus on short-term or one-time interactions between humans and machines, but also look at how these interactions and these patterns of social cognition develop over time. And ideally in everyday environments and potentially even, and I know it sounds challenging, but hey, these are the challenges of social neuroergonomics with easy to use off the shelf products so that we can reach a, uh, a wide range of customers that potentially have um, accessibility issues or maybe even cognitive impairments so that it's not just research that happens in the lab, but also is 
available to, to real people in real life. And so I'm sure most of you know that little Cosmos, Cosmo robot. It's, a, it's just one example. There are many, many more. Um, but it's a very affordable robot where, um, where the company um, gives you access to the SDK so you can program the robot and can there's even shared code on GitHub. So it's also open science community here where you know people really share um, their codes and it is really nice to do research with this platform. And we have done studies, for instance, where we asked people to take Cosmo home and interact with Cosmo at home, and then asked people to come back to the lab. And then we did an EEG study where we looked at reward processing, where they gambled for Cosmo or for another human. And we could show that certain EEG components that are related to reward processing are impacted by how familiar people were with that robot. And found some systematic relationship between the duration of the interaction and how rewarded people felt when they gambled and won for Cosmo, for instance. The second challenge is really from automation to autonomy. And here, uh, the challenge is that social neuroergonomics needs to foster a shift from automated, that means predefined, and rule-based systems that still work in structured environments to fully autonomous systems. For instance, adaptive artificial intelligence systems that can operate and adapt in changing environments. And that one of the challenges here, and that's not the only one, but one of the challenges since we are talking about social neuroergonomics is how do, for instance, people perceive robots or other social embodied agents as having a mind of their own. So being able to act and plan and, and experience the world around them. Um, another, ex so one example here also again from, from our research, we have for instance used a, um, a video game called Don't Starve Together, where people that people play online and where you can have one character being played by the participant and then another player either being played by another human or by an artificially intelligent system. And we have played around here with different uh, socially artificial systems and first did a Turing test where we wanted to see can people actually distinguish if they are playing against a human or if they are playing against an AI. And then also depending on what they believe who they are interacting with, does that have an impact on pro-social behavior or on punishment? So you can, for instance, here team up with other characters and fight together against others, or you can share goods, or you can, you know, give another person a gift. And it's still very, you know, early, and I can't really share a lot of data yet because we are still piloting. Um, but it is really interesting how strongly social behaviors in this relatively complex dynamic environment are impacted by beliefs about the social nature or the human nature of the interaction partner. And in, in general, uh, at some point, all of these research efforts should really help us to formulate minimal set of design features that really help trigger those very social areas in the human brain in a way that is similar to um, what we see in human-human interactions. The third challenge is from explicit to implicit measures. That is one of my favorite topics because I'm sure we have all been there where we, we saw research uh, that seemed fantastic, great human-robot interaction, and you have this high expectation that now you, you get this major insight and then most of the dependent variables are subjective ratings. Again, I'm not judging anybody. I have done that myself. I'm still doing that. So it's not to say we can't do that anymore. The message is more try to think about also incorporating other more implicit measures. So the challenge really is to at least combine explicit, so controlled, slow, conscious process measures and implicit measures that measure more automatic, fast, and subconscious processes. And to in, in general, 
create insight or generate insight about how these explicit and implicit processes work to work together in dynamic human machine interactions. So and I want to give you another example from my own research. Um, here we were wondering um, which robot or agent um, people um, can, or which robot would be best to perform a certain task with. And we used a morphing procedure where we morph a human face into a robot face. And what you see here is essentially faces that vary in human likeness from 0% to 100%. And so what we actually did first was really use explicit measures where we ask people on a, using a seven point Likert scale, do you think this agent um, has a mind? Do you think this agent would feel pain if it fell? Do you think this agent is likable and so on and so forth? And what you usually get when you do this is when you manipulate physical human likeness, you get a somewhat linear pattern or at least, uh, you know, mono monotonous uh, pattern where as you increase physical human likeness, ratings usually go up. Then we embedded the same images into a behavioral task. In this case, a vigilance task. Uh, where we measured sustained attention. Uh, in this task, you see uh, one of the agents first look at you, then change case direction, and then either look at or away from a gun or a hairdryer. And it's a sustained attention task and participants only have to press a button when the agent looks at a gun. It doesn't matter if it's a human-like agent or a robot-like agent, you only press when this event happens. And because it's a vigilance task, this event doesn't happen very often. So over time, your hit rates go down, your false alarm rates go up, and your reaction time goes up as well. That's called the vigilance decrement. And so I'm showing you now the results of this study. And you see that the pattern looks very different. Uh, the more negative the bars are, the stronger, the bigger the vigilance decrement, that means the worse, the more um, impacted the, um, the sustained attention performance was over time. And what you really see what was interesting is that the 70% human agent, so what's always described as maybe the uncanny agent, uh, creates or causes the strongest vigilance decrement. And when you compare the pattern on the left and the pattern on the right, you see that your data on the left is not very predictive of the data on the right. So this is just one of very many examples um, that really uh, motivated me to think more consciously about combining these explicit and implicit measures and put effort into using more implicit measures in the future. And that can be, that is still obviously not very dynamic here. This is still research that's done on a computer screen. So in the future, this should be combined with the challenges that I mentioned before, where we want to use implicit measures also in a dynamic social interaction in real life, ideally. Um, and this is another example here where uh, we have actually started to use now in an entrainment task. So we're now taps with another human and where we wanted to see uh, if uh, synchronization in tapping frequency uh, is somewhat correlated to your prior exposure to now and also still ongoing uh, research, but we see some evidence there that the more familiar you are with the robot, the more quickly you synchronize your tapping frequencies with the robot, and the more you stay in sync if you don't get visual feedback anymore from the robot's tapping. So just as examples, I'm very excited to see some of the keynote speakers examples later. Um, it's just for illustration purposes here. Challenge number four, from diets to groups. So here, the, we know that most uh, social neuroscience or even human robot interaction research was mainly focused on uh, interactions between one human and one robot or one machine. But we need to expand this, obviously, to interactions between humans and machines in groups and mixed groups and even cultures. Um, 
because when you only look at diets, you can, they lack certain group specific manifestations um, that social, um, uh, social agents um, or and social agents are often um, asked to uh, assist and interact with groups of people. So um, we must understand these processes in, um, in human robot group interactions. We have done here, for instance, a task on um, um, this, the ash paradigm where um, we looked at the influence of a consistently but incorrectly answering majority of computers, robots, and humans uh, on conformity in uh, human participants. We have slightly many, um, modified the task. I don't need to go into detail here, but essentially we have uh, seen, we had a social task where people have to make a judgment about um, emotional states and an analytical task where people had to do an arithmetic task. And before they gave their answer, uh, a certain number of computers, robots, or humans have given an answer. And what we find is, is that depending on task, you see a strong impact um, of um, agent type, where if you do the social task, the computer and the robot have a signif significantly less um, strong impact on conformity than the humans. And again, these things, this is just an example. We need to expand that kind of research to more diverse cultural populations and need to focus on human machine teaming in the future. Which brings me to my last, uh, to the last challenge from lab to natural environments. Um, the, what we all want to do, but what is often very difficult when once we start doing it. We all know that in particular neuroscience measures are often very invasive and restrictive and do not easily allow for dynamic social interactions, in particular if you have a machine in the picture. Um, and the challenge here is to really start in the lab and use the insights uh, that we gain there on regions of interest um, and really use mobile neuroimaging tools. And I hope some of the um, keynote speakers will, will show us how they solve this problem for now um, and combine it with easy to use social robots and computational uh, analysis methods to really see how if these uh, the same brain areas are also activated in complex dynamic environments. Um, and we really need these interactive paradigms that start in the lab and then transfer to the wild. And again, I've mentioned that earlier, these off the shelf robots like Cosmo, for instance, because they are so cheap and easy to use, you can easily use them and give them to participants so that they can take them home and that they can really interact with them for a long period of time and then come back to the lab and then do um, traditional social neuroscience experiments in the lab. Or also uh, another interesting thing, George Mason has these Starship robots on campus now and uh, there are more and more of these environments now where you really have robots interact with people in complex environments. So that's obviously another uh, interesting um, set where we can do these realistic studies in the wild. That brings me now to introducing um, our fabulous keynote speakers um, who um, one after the other will address um, one of the five challenges that I've just introduced. And because those are very distinguished people, we need to make a modification again. Um, we will start with Emily Cross. Emily Cross is currently a professor of so, uh, social robotics at two universities, University of Glasgow and Macquarie University in Australia. Um, Emily's research focuses on um, social robotics but also action perception coupling and um, perception of aesthetics. Uh, and she will talk about challenge one or she will address challenge one. And her talk is, the title of her talk is Probing the Flexibility of Social Perception Reveals Important Insights into Observation and Interaction. Then uh, we will move on to Peter Hancock, uh, who is Pegasus Professor, Provost, Distinguished Re Research Professor and Trustee Chair at the University of Central Florida. Um, Peter will address challenge two from automation to autonomy. 
And the title of his talk is Malicious Intent, the Crumbling Boundaries of Individual Humanity. Then we will move on to Lorna Quant. Lorna is Assistant Professor of Educational Neuroscience at Gallaudet University. Um, her research focuses on um, understand using behavioral and neural um, tools to understand um, sign language. And she uses virtual reality and social robots to help with that. And the title of her talk is Embodied Sign Language Learning in Virtual Reality Using EEG as an Implicit Measure of Learning. Then we will move on to Brian Sassilati, um, Professor of Computer Science, Mechanical Engineering and Material Science at Yale University. Brian is definitely a pioneer in social robotics. Every time I want to know if somebody has done a study already, I go to your website and check it out. <laughs> and um, Brian will address um, challenge four from diets to groups. And the title of his talk will be what robots teach us about human behavior. And then last but not least, Antonia Hamilton. She is a professor of social neuroscience at University College London. Um, her research focuses on uh, social interactions uh, in healthy individuals, and she examines whether certain social cognitive processes uh, develop in the same way in individuals with autism dis uh, spectrum disorder or if they develop differently. And she will address challenge five um, from laboratory to natural environments, and that is also the title of her talk. I am very excited to your talks and I hand it over to you now. <laughs> 